first letter to the Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight. Timothy chapter 6. And our subject in just a single study is the war against sin. Now, there's no special pressing reason why I should bring this subject before you. I'm not uh, bound or compelled to do so by any event or lapse or tragedy known to me among ourselves, but there's a constant burden to have to revisit this whole topic from time to time of what the King James Version translates as the exceeding sinfulness of sin. In this world, Satan makes an all-out attempt to wreck and to destroy. The world, particularly the church, the people of God, and the gospel, and the truth, and each one of us. This could almost be described in the Apostle's words as Satan's little season. There seems to be a final crescendo of iniquity and of lawlessness. There's a furious spiritual war to maim and to kill spiritually. Never in our history have we seen such uh, sophisticated attacks on sexual morality, such inducements to covetousness, so much even in public life, and great institutions of fraud and lies, so much self-indulgence and human pride seems to reach towering proportions. And we're called as the people of God to stand, to rescue by the power of the Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel and to maintain ourselves clear from all these things. Satan seek, seeks to capture the world and also to enter into the churches of Christ. We've seen trends among the churches whereby uh, the message of self becomes more important than the message of the gospel. Such uh, audacious movements as the prosperity gospel movement, so much against the scriptures and the standards of the scriptures. Of course, the whole healing ministry of the charismatic world is really uh, uh, a concern for self. And people speak of having God's best for me Instead of it being a war against sin, it seems to be a great campaign to secure somehow the blessing of God on a life of self-indulgence and comfort. For me, for me, for me. And even in the reform world, certainly among some of the celebrity preachers, you get far more exposition without application, without exhortation, and holiness seems to just go on to the sidelines. And so from time to time, we have to remind ourselves of passages like this, which speak of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the immeasurable sinfulness of sin, or as the Greek would have it, the over and beyond measure of sinfulness and sin. And that's the task of the law. I'm going to go to chapter 5 in a moment, but here's this 13th verse of chapter 7. The apostle asks, Was then that which is good, and he's speaking about the commandments of God, was then that which is good made death unto me? Because as he's been pointing out, it's only when the standards of the law really came home to him and convicted him that sin came to life for him. In other words, he realized its nature, its awfulness, its destructiveness, its sinfulness 
Was then that which is good, the law, made death to me because it killed me and it showed me I was under condemnation? God forbid, he says, but sin, that it might appear sin. The law, the commandments, showed it up for what it was, working death in me, bringing me under conviction. By that which is good, that sin, by the commandments of the law, might become, in my estimation, in my view, in my realization, immeasurably sinful. It's only when we come under conviction by the law of God that we wake up to the sinfulness of sin and its depths and its hideousness and its degree of hatefulness to God. But I'm going back now to look at this from chapter 5 and verse 12. And it is a warning to us and a jolt to us with much encouragement on the way. But we need this from time to time. So look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. The passage which speaks of the two representative men. One was Adam, the other was Christ, who is God and man. Wherefore, the apostle begins by pointing out the contrast between them, but first the similarities. Wherefore, as by one man, and I'm going to do this in a simple expository manner, verse 12, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So sin entered, bringing death with the fall of Adam, Death in the spiritual realm, alienation from God, and death in the physical realm. Men began to die. It came in, it's interesting terminology, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world. There's going to be a background image throughout the passage of a great war, the war of sin. It's Satan's war. Satan seeks to bring down God's creation and God's whole purpose. And he seems to succeed with the fall of man. And sin enters in like an army taking the field. That's the imagery which runs through the passage and is referred to two or three times. But it's a background imagery. Wherefore, as by one man, this army of sin, this campaign of sin, entered into the world, bringing with it death, and death passed upon all men, permeated totally the whole of humanity. So that's the 12th verse, and it's plain, and it's understandable. Now verse 13 in this passage seems to raise an objection, and the apostle doesn't uh, handle it as an objection, he kind of takes it in his stride as a statement. But that's what it is. It's an objection. The hearer is assumed to be thinking, death has come in, but the law hasn't come yet. The law will not come in until Moses. So from Adam to Moses, if there is no law, then how can people be held guilty in the light of God's standards. Verse 13, so it appears to be an objection, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin, we could insert the word surely here. It isn't there, I'm just suggesting it to you for the sense. But sin is surely not imputed when there is no law. So what was the status of people? Sin was in the world, it had permeated the whole of human society, and yet uh, uh, the law is not there. They cannot surely be blamed. Well, actually, the Apostle Paul has already dealt with this in chapter 1 and pointed out, or chapter 2, we can just read those verses. In chapter 2 and verse uh, 12, for as many as have sinned without law, He's referring to the Gentiles, but also it applies to all people before the law was given unto Moses. 
as many as have sinned without law shall perish without law, and as many as have, as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And verse 14 of Romans 2, here is the reason why. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they've not had it preached to them, the written standards of God's holiness, when the Gentiles do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. The phrase doesn't mean what we generally use it to mean today, but it means they have their own law. Paul's going to say it's written in their constitution. Yes, they haven't had preached to them the published law of the Ten Commandments, but they have it written in their consciences. Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and proving it, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. And the fact that people feel bad about their conduct at certain times proves that the conscience is there, though, of course, it is largely suppressed and overwritten, but it's there. And so even though they've never had the law preached or printed and put in front of them, they're still subject to it. So going back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, nevertheless, you might think that because there's no law, people cannot be held responsible, but says Paul, they plainly were held responsible because death reigned. They were judged, and the consequences of sin was meted out by God. And from the time of the fall, death reigned. So God was holding them responsible. Don't think, because the law hasn't appeared in published form, that people were immune from God's judgment. No, it plainly was there because death reigned. That doesn't mean it took everyone. We know there were many believers and faithful people from the early Old Testament record, but death reigned. It did take people who were far from God. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. They hadn't done exactly what he'd done, but they had their own sins in following him, and so they were under judgment. So don't be uh, distracted by verse 13. That's a kind of objection that the reader might have, which is answered in verse 14 and continues to be answered, but another theme opens up in verse 15. So verse 15, we get the great contrasts. There are similarities between Adam and Christ. Verse 14, the last part of the verse, speaking of Adam, who is the figure of him that is to come, the picture, the type, there are parallels between Adam and Christ. The parallels are obvious. Both were the father of a nation, Adam of the entire human race, and Christ of those who would be saved. Both worked, were representatives, and they did a work. Adam fell, he disobeyed God, that was his work, and he fell, and all his family, the human race, fell in him. Christ worked in that he lived a life of perfect, perfect, perfect righteousness under tremendous temptation and provocation, and his righteousness secures a benefit for all the redeemed, and he suffered and died on Calvary, the supreme act of obedience to bear the punishment of sin for all who believe. So both of them were men, though Christ was God also, the God-man. Both of them were parents of a race, the human race, and the redeemed, and both of them did a work which affected 
all the members of their race. Adam the fall, Christ purchasing redemption for his own, who is the figure of him that was to come. But there the similarities end. From verse 15, the parallels between Adam and Christ are all opposites. The similarities end with verse 14 and the parallel differences, the parallel opposites begin to be expounded from verse 15. And all this will be a great jolt to us to be much more concerned about sanctification and about sin. Now, in verse 15, at first, Paul doesn't refer to Adam and to Christ. He refers to them, but not by name, but by their work. Verse 15, look at the technique which is employed in the reasoning. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. So instead of naming Adam and naming Christ, he names what they accomplished. The offence is the best we can do for identifying Adam. The free gift is the term he chooses for identifying Christ. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. The parallel opposites begin and we're warned. The offence is going to be very different from the free gift. And here are the differences. For if through the offence, that terrible, terrible offence called disobedience further on, if through the offence of one many be dead, it was death and condemnation across the whole human race, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is also by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Look at the terms distinguishing these two works. The offence is just many be dead. The free gift, well, you start with a much more, much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace is by one man hath abounded. Much more hath abounded. Double, triple superlatives employed. It's flowed so copiously, so richly, so massively. And of course it has. The outcome of Adam's work is death, cessation, punishment, judgment, doom, terror, alarm. How much superior is the result of Christ's work? Life, eternal life and vigor and light and understanding and happiness and rejoicing. So the superlatives are justified. Much more hath abounded unto many. The language of the apostle, well, perhaps there's too many words for us in our translation, but the contrast is tremendous. And then in verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, another parallel opposite coming up. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So Adam disobeyed, and that act of disobedience brought a righteous condemnation from God upon him and his entire family. But the free gift, undeserved and unearned, is of many offenses. They've multiplied since Adam committed his act of disobedience, and since the human race fell, vast numbers of people have committed vast numbers of offenses. This isn't a good illustration, but it's almost like an investment. You start with a small sum, you invest it, you're very, very fortunate. You didn't know that that investment would be the most successful that there had ever been in the world, and you end up with a fortune. Well, it's not a good illustration because this is about something awful, not something beneficial, 
but here it is, Adam's one terrible compound act of disobedience becomes the vast number of sins of multitudes of people. Adam only fell. He went to a cliff edge. There was a thousand foot drop in a terrible act of disobedience. He goes over the edge, taking the future of the human race with him. You might say an easy thing to do, a terrible thing to do, an act of disobedience which cost him almost nothing to accomplish but to bring the human race back up again to the top, to land, smashed and broken all the way, took a tremendous act of atonement and obedience. So there's a terrific chasm separating the acts, an easy act downwards and a tremendously difficult act to compensate and atone for multitudes of sins and not as it was by one that sinned so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification pardon and life for all who trust in Christ and then the apostle builds it up further in verse 17 For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, and it did reign, and it's still reigning in countless lives and dominates lives, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life everlastingly and even now by one, Jesus Christ. So the accomplishment of Adam's work, tragically and sadly, perhaps despite this, he was personally saved in his life as time went on. But oh, the legacy left was terrible. If by one man's offense, death reigned, much more is the reign of Christ. It's a better reign. It accomplishes so much more. It achieves so much more. That's the reasoning of the apostle here. The reign of death is vicious. It's invincible if there's no forgiveness, no salvation. It's progressive. You think of an affliction such as alcoholism or any addiction And that really only pictures all sin. Sin of pornography, sin of lying, sin of selfishness, sin of ill temper and unkindness. These things progress. They get worse and worse. They grow. They become harder and harder to control. It's a reign of sin in lives, throughout life, to death. But the reign of life, that's a tremendous word, reign. Let me explain why. A Christian may come to you, to a pastor, and say, I'm doing such and such. He's not obliged to name his sin. The pastor doesn't take confessions. Confessions must go to God. However, he may say to get help, I'm doing such and such a thing and I cannot help it. I succumb to this temptation over and over again. I'm in its grip. He's almost got to thinking he's not to blame because after all, the sin is so powerful, the attraction so strong. He's almost justifying himself. I cannot help it. In fact, he thinks a little well of himself. Look how humble I'm being, confessing this and acknowledging my weakness. But it cannot be helped. Yes, but it can be helped because here is the tremendous encouragement. The language of the scriptures talks about a reign, a reign. In other words, however grave the sin or the tendency 
or the temptation, if you really mean business and you are truly repentant before the Lord and you really want to break free from that and you take all the precautions and measures the scriptures lays down and you appeal to God for help, he will give it to you. This is a reign. If you're a saved man and woman, you can surmount that temptation. It is your weakness if you fail to do so. It is because you're not serious enough. It is because you are not heeding the Holy Spirit speaking through the voice of conscience and laying hold upon the help of God. You're not determined and anxious enough because the power of God is toward believers. This is a reign, not just the eternal reign, reigns even now. That, I think, is a mighty encouragement. Yes, sin is terrible, but it's most terrible to the casual and the overconfident and the indifferent and the half-hearted. But if we're serious as believers before the Lord, we have his help. And the rain language comes up repeatedly in this passage. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment, uh, judgment is in italics, but it is the subject in hand, came upon all men to condemnation. That makes it clear that the italicization for sense is just and right. Condemnation came upon all, the just condemnation of God for sin, by the righteousness imputed to us of one, the righteousness of Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And the words mean this, the justice of God can be honored. God in his justice must punish all sin, but God in his justice is bound and pledged to forgive all sin born by Jesus Christ. The punishment is taken by him. It is by justice that we are forgiven because we trust in Christ. And we remember that. But coming down to verse 20, well, verse 19, now we move not only to the the judicial act of forgiveness, but by the actual healing of sin. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now we're not talking so much about their guilt. We're talking about their nature, their character. They are sinners by character. So by the obedience of one, namely Christ, shall many be made righteous. By coming to Christ and trusting in him, we are first of all made legally righteous. That is, we are declared righteous by a declaration of God on high who views us in Christ because we're under Christ's wing, under his shed blood, under his atoning death and his act of obedience, and all his righteousness is imputed to us, we are declared legally clean. Then there is the work of sanctification, progressive righteousness imparted to us, where God begins to work in our hearts and we are convicted of our daily sin and we pray to him and yield ourselves to him and strive in righteousness. So progressive righteousness is implemented in us until finally we shall be made actually wholly righteous. So there are the three forms of righteousness. Legal righteousness that we have on conversion. Progressive righteousness. Don't frustrate it. Don't be slack and confident and easy in life. Practice self-examination and regular repentance. Strive constantly for righteousness so that progressive righteousness can be affected. And one day, 
there'll be perfect righteousness. So there's the state and condition contrasting between Adam and Christ in verse 19. And then in verse 20, this great statement about the law which captures our attention. Moreover, the law entered. Ah, now sin, the army of sin, entered the field at the beginning of the passage. Now the law has entered the field. What does that do? Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. What offense? Well, the disobedience of Adam, the disobedience of the whole human race as the result, the great multitude of sins that the human race commits, the law entered that the offense might abound. When we first read this in our Christian lives, we're perplexed that the Ten Commandments were published so that sin might seem greater and victorious, and it concerns us. And surely Satan gloats, ah, God has done something which only highlights my victory. He's published the law. Good for him. Now it's obvious, more obvious, just how great my victory is and how low I brought the human race. The law entered that the offense, and we might just as well read offenses now, because it's not just Adam, it's the whole human race, might abound and overflow. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Yes, the giving of the law makes it obvious how sinful we are and how much sin is in the world. The law is a magnifying glass to sin. Here's the world before the law under Moses and it's a dark and gloomy place. There is light, there's the light of conscience and man shall be judged by it. But by the published law, the standards are even clearer and the transgressions show up all the more glaringly and obviously. So it seems that the law is almost helping sin by showing just how bad things are and how low things have got. But also, grace, the message of grace and salvation and forgiveness is made all the more wonderful. I'm going to choose a rather grisly illustration. Someone's very sick. Something, a shadow on the x-rays. Finally, all the imaging shows that there's some problem. And the surgeon carries out an operation. And there, exposed to view, is a horrific tumour. And its size and its invasive power is seen. And the surgeon will then, of course, try to operate and do his best. But the first stroke of surgery only showed how bad the problem was. And that's the law. The law comes and it shows just how great sin is in the world. We need the law, you know. I'm not under law, you say I'm under grace. Yes, you are. You can't be saved by the law. It can only show us the worst about us. But we need that. And sometimes I think the uh, Anglican tradition has something going for it in its liturgy. Because numerous times over, every week in all sorts of services, the Ten Commandments are rehearsed and read and repeated and repeated. I wonder how many of us regularly read the Ten Commandments. Now I think in a liturgy perhaps it's not so good because people get so used to us to it, it just trips off the lips and runs over the mind. But you know, we, read, we need the commandments. And we need not only the commandments, we need the great sin lists of the scripture. You think of the sin list that the Apostle Paul has just covered there in the earlier chapter, in chapter 1 
And towards the end of the chapter, the long list of horrific sins. The Apostle Paul has five sin lists throughout his epistles. You know, we need to read them often. You read the scripture, it lifts up your heart, read great things about Christ, read the promises of God, read the narratives, ask the questions, love the word of God, but regularly, often, go to the commandments, read them solemnly, search your heart, read one of the sin lists, search your heart. We need it because the law shows up sin. Have I done that in some shape or form? Is this true of me? What is the truth about me as a believer? Am I walking casually? Am I tripping along carelessly? This is the word of God. The law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, Grace did much more about. It's only as the realization of sin is awakened in us and conviction comes that we know the sweet balm of forgiveness and the mercy of Christ and the refreshing of the soul. That as sin hath reigned unto death, a reign, even so might grace reign through righteousness in life, through sanctification, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What reigns in our lives? Is there unconfessed sin? Some particular act, thought, deed, attitude, which goes uncorrected? No conviction? No attention paid to it? Look at the opening words of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we live lightly? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, knowing that we're the redeemed and forgiveness will come? God forbid. May it never be. Said in the strongest possible way by Paul. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We who have been delivered from condemnation we for whom such a heavy price has been paid to secure forgiveness. How shall we? How can we? Know ye not that so many of us have, as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You've made a public pledge. You're pledged to Christ. How can you be casual about sin? says the Apostle Paul. This is going to be his application, his purpose of the passage. Never give sin freedom. Don't be so foolish and so blind. It'll hurt you terribly. It'll bring you down. We're not under its reign. This is such foolishness and such insulting behavior to God and such indifference to our vows. Do we lose our temper? Do we have inordinate affections? Is there little self-discipline? Do we lack integrity in our excuses and exaggerations? Do we lack humility, proud of ourselves? Are we unselfish? We'll go back to chapter 7, verse 13. The inexpressible, immeasurable sinfulness of sin and God hates it at the end of the verse, exceeding sinful. You think of that terrible Ebola outbreak, and you shudder. And you think thousands of people in one, two, three nations affected. Such a terrible scourge and so difficult, even for the West, with all its skills and prowess to bring under control. And that's merely a picture, really, of sin and what it'll do to us and how it can spread through each individual life by being casual. We live in the most dangerous age ever and the most infectious also. I've, I've seen over the years some awful things happen in life. 
And I've known husbands and wives separated, marriages collapse. And I've spoken to men who had no sense of what they'd done, even though their conduct was ill-tempered and terrible, and they became impossible to live with. And if you meet them, they're still justifying themselves five years later. They don't get it. They don't see it. Well, of course, they may not truly be converted. But what a terrible thing to get out of the way of self-examination and humility and repentance so that we reign. We have, we stumble, yes, but we know a certain measure of conquest over sin. And all true believers should have that, that strong measure of conquest because you're reigning. Sin is still there, it's still in you, and you will stumble and fall. But you shouldn't have great falls, and you shouldn't fall into great sins if you're really serious. That's why I worry too in these modern days about attendance at services and weeknight meetings, because life is difficult. And these days, this commercial world wants to squeeze the last drop of blood out of every worker. And people are working long hours and suffering strain and great difficulties. And there are sicknesses and family illnesses and complications. And then every now and then you have to take a new course. And that distracts you. Yes, I know there are a hundred understandable reasons why we can't always be absolutely regular. But how easily these legitimate problems make a, a regular lapse in our lives. And people gradually fall away from attendance or come every now and then. What foolishness possesses us? As believers, we need the word of God and the regular challenge of the scripture and the help and companionship of fellow believers. We desperately need these things. What sort of pride gets into us? I can cope. I can manage. I can be cut corners, be casual about this. Passages like this show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It's viciousness and it's power. So, dear friends, this is the subject which is really before us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Satan and his hosts watch us all the time. And if we lose sense of the ongoing campaign and the seriousness of sin, then they plan to trap and to bring us down the wiles of the devil, to exploit us, to cause maximum hurt. So, dear friends, carry the flag of Christ with real desire for holiness. Never forget what we've been delivered from, what we've escaped. Seek conviction of sin and self-examination. Keep clear of temptation. And if things like pornography come along, hate it and fight it and end it with intensity as immediately before it brings you down into hypocrisy and hidden sin. So it's a, it's a very negative topic, but it's a vital one, and I have no particular cause to bring it before you, but I was just moved afresh to see those words, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. You need to see the immeasurable hideousness and wickedness of sin as it is. And only then do you get to reign over it by the help of God.